You know, we have plays in there called to worship. Come, let us bless the Lord who commands the wind. Come, let us worship the three in one who appoints fire and flame as messengers. Come, let us bless our great and glorious Maker, giver of all good gifts. You join now, let's stand and sing our first hymn when morning gills the skies if you want to use your hymnal as before you set.
you all want to, please come on up and join me. very 
everybody. And it's very fun when Jesus' disciples share the good news of Jesus with others. Absolutely. So, that's our story today about Pentecost, the 50th day after Easter, the birthday of the church, the day that we celebrate when the Holy Spirit comes on all God's people to remind us of Jesus and his love. So, could you pray with me? Please repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Spirit of Jesus so we can spread God's love today and every day. Friends, today is the day of Pentecost, 
And Pentecost is the third big holiday of the Christian year. No, it's not as complicated and as involved as Christmas, that day when we celebrate our God loved the world so much that God would be born into the world. And thankfully, you and I don't have to worry about Christmas trees and presents and lights and wreaths and cars and poinsettias and stuff. Pentecost is an Easter either. We're not celebrating that God raised Jesus to life and life evermore by defeating the powers of sin and death and opening the way to the whole world to live with God. Not just now, but for all eternity. And because it's not Easter, you and I don't have to worry about colored Easter eggs and we don't have to worry about egg hunts and Easter lilies and Easter outfits and Easter bunnies and ham dinners with family. No, today is Pentecost. The blessedly simple yet supremely holy day on which Christ's followers celebrate the birthday of the Church of Jesus Christ. Pentecost is the day that Jesus' disciples experience the gift of the Holy Spirit, and for many in the Church, it's becoming a favorite holiday because it has yet to be consumed by cultural traffic, traditions, and greeting card manufacturing. But as wonderful as the Pentecost holiday is, mighty winds, tongues of fire, people from all over the world, different languages, over 3,000 converts to Christianity from a single sermon, Pentecost can be pretty depressing for a church leader. As Acts tells it, who can doubt that the Holy Spirit is powerfully at work on that day? Vibrant mission, transformed lives, passionate faith, expanding outreach and bold preaching. Perhaps you can understand why these are difficult words for contemporary church leaders to hear. The book of Acts describes the gift of the Spirit in such a powerful, over-the-top kind of way that you've got to begin to wonder, was the day more fiction than fact? More dream than reality? More ideal than real? Because I don't know about you, but the book of Acts' understanding of the early church bears very little resemblance to the church today. Today, in the second decade of the 21st century, churches in America, from the Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, Orthodox, you name them, churches are struggling. They're finding it hard to fill the pews, to meet the annual budgets, and Sunday school is becoming a thing of the past. Forget about trying to recruit Sunday school teachers. Church leaders struggle to help define the Christian faith as a way of life, of simplicity, of service, of honor, and humility, when all too often what folks really want to hear from church is that following Jesus brings prosperity and perpetual happiness and cheap grace that means we just keep doing what we want to do and how we want to do, to whom we want to do, and God, like some kind of doting grandparent, will simply smile at us from heaven and forgive us so that we don't have to change a blessed thing about how we live. The modern church exists in a culture where, as one preacher says, People come faithfully every Sunday, whether it's too bad or too good. The temptation on Pentecost Sunday is to hear the story of the first Pentecost and to idealize the early church and to question the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Many, many people do this. They say that they're spiritual but not religious. They reject the Church of Jesus Christ as decaying and quaint and probably corrupt uh, organization that has long passed its prime. Voting with their feet on Sunday mornings, millions upon millions fill up coffee shops or brunch tables or sports leagues or simply stay at home for a leisurely morning in bed. And all this leads a church leader to wonder if maybe the critics are right. 
Maybe things have been downhill for the church ever since the days of Peter and Paul as described in the book of Acts. Maybe the Holy Spirit moved on after Pentecost, and you and I, the few of the faithful who hung in there, are the ones left behind like our ancestors, wandering in the wilderness of confusion and fear. Even the most devoted among us, I think, wonder from time to time if God is indeed in this place. In Bethel First Presbyterian Church, in Campbellsville, or in any church for that matter. And what some of us wouldn't give for the sound of a violent wind and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and heads and hearts and lives on fire. You and I, the people of God, we want some sure sign of God's presence with us in our midst, right here. We want Holy Spirit, and we question where God's Holy Spirit might be. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the presence of the risen Christ? Where is that blessed assurance that God, the Lord and giver of life, is with us? And I've heard these questions asked in hospital rooms and in committee meetings. I've heard them uttered at mass shooting sites and at homeless shelters. I've heard them asked in prisons and in divorce courts, where is God? Where is the presence of God that Jesus called the comforter, the advocate, the Lord, and giver of life? Well, sisters and brothers, take heart for all the perfection of the church, the book of Acts chapter 2 and following, the book of Acts begins with precisely these questions. Acts chapter 1 begins with Jesus' ascension into heaven. At the ascension, Jesus promises that even though he's going into heaven, that he will send the Holy Spirit to guide and direct and inspire his followers. But as Acts begins, there's no sign of the Spirit's presence. The book of Acts begins with the disciples craning their necks, looking up into heaven. I guess they figured that if Jesus left by ascending into heaven, going up into heaven, that the Holy Spirit would arrive by coming down from heaven. So all they need to do is look up. But then God sends two men in dazzling white clothes, two angels in the first chapter of Acts, to give the disciples a, a hint of where to find the Holy Spirit. These men ask, why do you disciples stand here looking up towards heaven? In other words, what the angels are saying is that if you're looking for the Holy Spirit by standing still with a dazed look on your face and craning your neck up skyward, if you're looking for the Holy Spirit to swoop down on you from heaven, then you're probably going to be mostly disappointed because you're looking. And here's where I think the Acts story intersects with our own stories of faith. What these ancient disciples discovered on that first Pentecost, and what I hope you and I can too on this Pentecost, is that the Holy Spirit is not a distant, remote reality that flows into our lives only periodically. No, the Holy Spirit is our constant companion. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. It is God's divine presence that fills us with hope and love and joy and peace and energy and for life and life more abundantly. But to recognize the Spirit's presence, you and I must search with new vision, with a different perspective. Where is the Holy Spirit? It's not primarily about God's presence snatching you and me into some ecstatic moment or vision. Nor is the Holy Spirit mostly about you and me hearing God's voice or feeling God tapping us on the shoulder. Although sometimes it might be. But the Holy Spirit is not so much about looking up to heaven in hopes of a God sighting. The Holy Spirit is about looking out, finding the Lord of life at present. Present and work here on the earth. Where is the Holy Spirit? I have felt the Holy Spirit 
and I have experienced the Holy Spirit in the songs of praise sung during worship by some tall Indian Presbyterians in the Chiapas state of southern Mexico. I have seen the Holy Spirit slip into the back row of a memorial service for a dead loved one. And I've watched the Spirit break boundaries of language and nation in churches throughout Kentucky and the U.S. as Christians gather together and worship in their own mother tongues, whether they be English or French or Swahili or Mandarin or Korean or Spanish or so many, many more. I have observed the Spirit's presence as friends pour out their hearts to one another and ask to be prayed for by the church to include the Spirit is present whenever children are baptized, or the lonely are visited, or the hungry are fed, or the homeless are housed, or foster children are providing beds for children to sleep in, or our elders are honored. The Spirit comes to us each time we do what our ancestors in faith did. Worship the joy of the hearts. Choose faith over fear. Welcome the stranger. Visit the sick. Live in the hope that pulls us out of this moment. The Spirit comes near when the people of God dream big dreams about a spirit-filled future of unbounded limitations. Our best days are always ahead of us as long as the Spirit is invited to be part of our mission and our community. Tom Long, a retired preaching professor at Emory University, tells the story of a woman he saw share her testimony in front of her church. The woman was a dancer in a professional ballet company. And when she spoke, it was clear that she was more comfortable as a dancer than she was as a speaker. She spoke hesitantly and haltingly. She explained that she had been raised in the church. She pointed over to the baptismal font, and she said that she was baptized as an infant right in that very time. She didn't remember it, of course, but she said that her father was very proud of the moment and that when she was a little girl, he would often tell her about the Sunday that she was baptized. He would describe the baptismal dress that she wore. He would remember for her the hymns that were sung and what the pastor had said in the sermon. He always ended the story by clapping his hands together and explaining Claiming, oh, sweetheart, the Holy Spirit was in the church that day. She said that as a child, she'd go to church on Sunday with her parents. But she would wonder, where is the Holy Spirit in the church? She would look at the shiny organ pipes and at the rafters and the ceiling and at the stained glass windows. And she would wonder, is that where the Holy Spirit is in church? But then she paused for a minute, and everybody in the room leaned forward to hear what she'd say next. As many of you know, she continued, I lost both my parents to cancer in the same week. It was a terrible week last winter. During that awful week on a dark Wednesday afternoon, I was driving home from burying, from visiting my parents in the hospital, and I was passing by the church. I felt an intense need for it. The church was dark and the shadows, and in the shadows I prayed and I poured out my heart and my grief to God. But there were some women in the church. They were in the kitchen preparing a meal for a church meeting. And they heard me praying. And they knew what was happening with my parents. And they took off their aprons Listen for the 
prayers of faithful women and men. Listen for the songs of joyful praise. You see, here's the good news for you and me today. All around us are signs of the Holy Spirit. Here in weekly worship and through the ministries of Bethel First Presbyterian Church of Campbellsville and in churches great and small throughout the world, they are filled with brothers and sisters in Christ who are working to be the church that does all that stuff in the Bible. You know, being the hungry, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, loving the neighbor, caring for the least and lost and lonely. As Christ followers, we are called through our baptisms to be God, to live into the Spirit. And the rest of the world doesn't always get it. You see, the Holy Spirit causes you and me to make sacrifices that other people just shake their heads at and cut their tongues at. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to forgive hurts that we, others would never consider forgiving. The Holy Spirit causes us to love people that others say are not worthy of loving. The Holy Spirit causes us to give away our resources because we know that we have more than we could ever need because there are others who are going without. The Holy Spirit causes us to see others not as nationalities or bank accounts or threats or political parties but as what we are. God's blessed, beloved and redeemed children Brothers and sisters in Christ's worldwide family. Friends, it is Pentecost. So I invite you to open your eyes. Open your minds. Open your hearts. And live in Pentecostal power. Claim the life-changing truth. Where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit's not way up there. Far, far. Holy Spirit is here. He and here and here. Charging us and changing us for life. Thanks be to God.
taught and passed down throughout the ages that we know as the Apostles' Creed, but is joined together in one voice, proclaiming our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, this is the time in our worship service that we seek to share Holy Spirit with one another as we pray for one another, as we uplift one another, as we care for one another in our world. And so it is this morning that there are many prayer concerns and announcements that are in your bulletin. Uh, I will call your attention to the whole prayer concern list that is there. Folks that um, are home and skilled care facilities and other places in our world that need healing and need the spiritual presence, that need life and life abundantly. We'd also like to ask if there are any additional prayer requests. Uh, all you need to, know, uh, to do is make them known by raising your hand or shouting them out, and I'll write them down, and we'll get them included in the prayer this morning. Um, and if there aren't any, then we'll head on over to prayer too. Uh, but are there any additional prayers uh, for this morning? If not, then let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Ever-living and ever-loving God, we praise you for your presence that is in all times and in all places and is with us in this time and in this place in worship now. You send the Spirit of Jesus to be with us again and again and you strengthen the church to be Christ's hands to those in need. Christ's heart to those in trouble. Christ's voice for justice and mercy. Transform our lives and societies that broken people might find healing, that lonely people find love, bitter people find peace, fearful people find hope, grieving people find comfort. Sick people find healing. Especially we ask, oh God, that you be with those that are listed in the bulletin this day and those that we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. May us and all for whom we pray and indeed all people find you to be the way and Come, Holy Spirit, take our world's leaders and governments and bring renewal. That communication can be open. That relationships between hostile people and hostile nations will evaporate. That a hunger for justice addresses the hunger for food felt by so many. Take our national leaders and cure them of partisan madness. Make them care more about doing what is good and just and beautiful and true instead of what will get them elected. Come, Holy Spirit, fill your church, that our worship will be ever more pleasing to you, that our prayers will change our minds and our behaviors, instead of trying to change you and yours, that our lives will make a real difference to real people in the real world. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our lives with your presence so that more and more every day, all that we do and all that we say and all that we hope will be an act of worship to you and an expression of love to others. For we ask all this to the glory of your name. And now, with the confidence.
confidence of the children of God, we pray together that prayer that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we are people who have been given so much. We've been given the presence of Christ in our lives. And it is out of that joy and out of that presence that we open our hearts, our arms, and our pocketbooks as we share the resources that we have been blessed with so that they might be used in and through the church to be a blessing to the world that God loves so very much. Now we bring to God our tithes and the morning offering.
love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And as you go on your way, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so you may abound in hope both this day and forevermore through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.